we have one more week next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, we had some scheduling difficulties, and then we decided, okay, fine, let's just stick with the regular schedule time. But then it turns out that the doctor over in uh, New York is going to be able to make it at our time, mm -hmm. 1.40. So, so we will end up trying to do a televideo lecture. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that the, uh, that the, the networking family allows us to, to see it. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to get a copy of the presentation so I can write it this time. Uh, and then, so this will be Dr. Uh, Dr. Doherty, who's one, of, who's like one of the senior physician and scientists over at this Roswell Park Cancer Institute. So they'll be talking about photodynamic therapy. Uh, the person who's going to MC this is going to be Amy Grashek, who's a postdoc researcher with CBSC. Um, she's also been working in the field of PDT, and so I'm going to introduce her, and then she's going to introduce Dr. Doherty. So she'll be here on Tuesday as well. To do this. And then Friday, Friday will be just kind of a, a summary. I've already given out the. Uh, yeah, this way nobody nobody comes in. We don't walk into you. Okay. Yeah, the other door is obviously coming. Thursday. Yeah. yeah. So Thursday will be the last day of instruction for this class. And uh, I've already given you given you uh, copies of the of the exam, it's going to be a take on the exam, or the term paper battle. And if you have any questions that you want to ask other than the answers to the test questions, you can back about this. Right. So it'll be pretty easy. Is that going to be take home? The, the term papers are going to be due, technically they're due the week after the last day of class. So it'll be the 19th, I think, okay. of March. But basically we just need the papers in time to give you guys a grade and the dentist to submit it into the system. So whatever amount of time that is. If for some reason you've got other classes and you can't make it, or you want to ask for an extension, then just let us know. Okay. So um, Melissa's not here yet, but why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Robert Zawadzki from the Department of Vision Sciences. It's actually ophthalmology and vision science. Ophthalmology and vision science. Uh, who's going to be talking about, as you can see by the title, in vivo retinal imaging and retinal spectroscopy. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation for, for me to do this lecture. So, uh, basically, I'll talk today about the in vivo part of the, of, of the retinal imaging and retinal spectroscopy. So, just to start with, so I'm, uh, so our laboratory is located it's, uh, in the uh, Davis Med Center campus in Sacramento. So if you see here as the actually an old aerial photo of this of this campus, I think the CVC would be probably somewhere here. So this is the ambulatory care care center building, and we actually have departments on the on the second floor of this building. And our labs are a part of this of this uh, of this department, which actually changed the name to uh, UC Davis Eye Center recently. And actually, the big plans of, of building separate buildings. That's, that's kind of really interesting, and and uh, and so. What we're doing, we, we, we mainly looking, mainly working on the vision science part of that, uh, and we are we are mainly researchers. But I will try to start to give you some kind of overview of uh, the kind of what kind of clinical systems we have nowadays, and then what are the science grade instruments that that, that, that are kind of coming and probably will, will be available in the future for the imaging. And uh, basically, also background: so vision science is basically science that. Uh, Deals with the, with the visual system, and uh, and it's a, it's a huge uh, it's a huge it's a huge part. So basically, all kind of psychology, neuroscience, computer science, psychophysics, most of technology can be put into vision science. So, uh, so anything that has anything to do with the with the vision can be part of vision science. And uh, so in some this talk, I'll, I'll basically give you probably some kind of I will remind you about the, the eye in the retina and tell you why you know it's important to. Uh, to image retina and know more about the retina. And then I'll, I'll basically describe uh, some of the retinal imaging system. So first I'll talk about some basic characteristics of the eye. And then I will also describe the structure of the retina. And then I'll finish with, uh, with uh, showing you this, uh, this examples of retinal imaging systems, which are most popular now in the clinic. And also I'll talk about uh, some of the, the things I'm, I'm working on, which is basically using building really high, ultra high resolution in vivo imaging system for the retina with adaptive optics. And then at the end I will also 
talk about the uh, renal spectroscopy. And then if, if the time if we, have, if we have enough time, I'll also give you some examples of the of the applications of this of this modern system for <coughs> imaging. So first about eye eye in the retina. So as, as you can see on this on this picture that the, the, vis- the human visual system is actually true for all the visual systems, mammalian systems and all, all the all the animals, it's rather complex. So the way our, our visual system works that we have two eyes or that we that we see them work. But what's, what's really interesting is that the, the, the signals we, we the images we're getting with the technique of our, of our retinas, which are on the on the back side of the eye, is already transferred, it's already processed, and then uh, sent in and pro- process information to the brain, to the part of the brain which is responsible for vision. And then actually the way our, our brain works is that we, we actually uh, observing the word uh, in some kind of uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a funny way that we actually don't see our, our brain doesn't process images the way we, 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 we perceive them in real life so actually we, we have emotion detection we have a shape uh, depth or color de- detection but the things that the, the retina is actually uh, heavily involved in image processing and, uh, and it's actually uh, seen as a part of the brain so basically the, the, the eyes and the retina is already where, 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 the, where the image processing starts so that's why it's important for vision scientists to, to study eyes and retina, but also from the you know practical uh, ophthalmologist perspective, uh, very often uh, if the vision is affected, it's also happening very often on the retinal level. So if you have any kind of eye disease, if it is happening on the retina, then you really have problems because they're, it's really hard to treat it and it's really hard to uh, to help the patients. However, if you have a good diagnostic, you may be, you may be able to predict changes before they happen. So that's why the the retina is the, it's, it's, a, it's a critical bottleneck in the system because it, it basically, if it's not working uh, in the back of your eye, the signals cannot be transferred to your brain and you cannot have, have, a, have a perception of, of, of the vision. And so here, here is an, uh, a view of the human eye. So again, if this would be cross-section of the eye, so here it is, is the, the word you're looking at. The eye is, uh, is built like a simple uh, camera with the, with the optics and here is your detector. And basically the retina is the, is the back side of, of your eye. And the, the center part of the, of the eye is the macula. That, that's the part when you have uh, the best vision. And actually that, that's an optical axis of your eye. And again, because this is uh, a part that uh, transfers optical signals into electrical signals, then all the signals are transferred to the brain through this optical optic nerve head. So everyone, so basically you're getting the image of the retina and then it's transferred to the uh, to the brain after some processing. So the main parts of the eye are, uh, are it's iris here, it's the cornea, it's the lens, and then here's the retina, and uh, so that, 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 that's the most important part. And, and basically in this talk we will just focus on uh, imaging and, and learning about the structure and some of the function of, of the retina here. And also I would mention if you have any questions please uh, let me know, I'm happy to answer the screen that we missed this talk. So here's some more, even more detailed view how, how this is all arranged in the, in the, in the eye. So again, this, this is how basic cameras work. So you have an optics and here you have an image. So you have, uh, in, this, in this case, some lady out of your eye. You would, you would, your optical system of the eye would create an image of this lady on the back of the, of the retina. And again, here's actually some kind of uh, magnified view. So you can see there's a lot of structures and basically are, are, are responsible for transferring this image and sending it uh, to the brain, and uh, so, and the main components of, of the retina actually are here for the receptors, they're rods and cones, and those are all kind of uh, cells that basically are doing image processing, and then the, the, la- the top layer is actually nerve fiber layer that basically sends the, the electrical signal to the brain. And it, what's interesting is that on, throughout the whole retina, all the cir- circuitry is on top of our photo- on our uh, detectors on the other sectors, but um, in the very center all is uh, kind of uh, pushed aside, so the light, which is really focused and it's really the, the sharpest image here in the fovea, actually enters the cones, which are really densely packed over here. Uh, the image is only created on the fovea? So, so actually, so, so, the, so this really, the interesting thing here is that it depends on the angular extension of the skin, but you actually, the, the best vision you have is actually in the center of the eye. So, so the way the way it works is that you have really so 
that the density of receptors is changing depending on the location, mm -hmm. and they're actually very densely packed just in the fovea. And you really have a good vision in the fovea, and then if you go really a couple degrees away, your vision is not as good, and it's probably that our brain is feeding up all the steam, so we, we don't really have a sharp vision outside the, the very center of our, of our visual field, but our brain is just able to, to, to feel all this information, and that's actually, uh, and that, that, that's actually something that's really hard to, to diagnose eye disease because people don't see any changes in their vision except it's too late. If you have a disease when, when you can almost get a half of your visual field, uh, not, not, you may not see completely with that, but you, your brain is just filling in and it's really, it's really interesting actually. And uh, also if you look here at the optic nerve, so optic nerve is actually about the size of the moon and it's a completely blind spot, but you, you don't realize you have it. But, but the very, but, but, and also that uh, if, if you get any changes in your retina, as long as they're outside the fovea, they're, they're kind of not, not, not bad to you because you can live with that, but as soon as you, as the center of the vision is affected, you really uh, have problems with, with things like reading and, mm -hmm. and, and everyday life. So that's, so the, the really, the most critical part is actually the center of the, of, 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 of the fovea. That's, that's the most critical part. Robert, what, is there a number, like a portion of the central field which is, by the uh, so, so I think the fovea is about one millimeter, and the eye is it's about 25 millimeters long. So it would be, I can't remember correctly, it's probably about three, so maybe five degrees field of view. Okay. Right. So, so it is proportional to the geometry. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not that it occupies, no. So actually, the retina actually. So if you look at here, you have other receptors all throughout this this uh, the back of the eye. However, their density is really changing, and you have, you have a kind of spike of photoreceptors in the center. And actually, you only get cones in the center, not, not even rods. So basically, in, in the night vision, you don't really have a high, res high resolution, just see the shapes of a kind of. So, that's, so rods are actually all throughout, but you don't have even rods in the center, because rods are not sensitive for... So the so rods are uh, very sensitive for the low light, low light level, but they, they cannot see colors, and, and, and they also are not good in... Uh, uh, in, in a really uh, high-resolution resolu high uh, viewing scenes, but uh, yeah. So, so now there's even more details about uh, about retina. So, so 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 basically here again, if you have a light going from this side, here's your, your your the back of your eye. Here are the other receptors. Here are the top layers. Now basically light is entering from the bottom here, <coughs> and here here would be the other receptors. So you have the longer ones are our cones, and uh, actually I think I'm, I'm wrong in this case. I think that the longer ones should be rods, and, and th this should be cones. So cones are basically bigger than the rods, and they're responsible for, 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 for our daylight vision and for the colors, and the rods are responsible for, for the night vision. And you can see that after, so basically th those cells here in that outer inner segment, this part of photoreceptors are, a, are detecting the, the light stimuli and they're transferring them to electric signals. So basically here, here is where the uh, change from the light to the, to, to the electric signal is happening. And then these electrical signals are then being transferred through all this circuitry to the nerve fiber layer and then through the nerve fiber layer down to the brain. And so here's, uh, so as you can see it's really complex, it's, it's very complex structure. And uh, so here's actually some example of, of, of uh, connections. So you can, you can see, of course, there's a lot of cells, but they're, they're interconnected in different ways. But basically, you have, again, photoreceptors. And then the signal from the photoreceptors would be uh, uh, transferred in lateral way and vertical way, which actually allows uh, the very basic general circuitry to, to, to change this, to, to process it it's in a way that can be fit through the through the nerve fiber layer to, to your to your brain. And actually, interesting thing is that I think there's there's only about uh, I think it's only about a million of the of the of the dendrites of the ganglion cells going to the brain. But there's I think about 10 million uh, for the receptors, about 100 million for the receptors. So there's there's a huge amount of processing and, and down uh, down processing of the information that was sent to the brain. But basically, the take-home message here is that retina is really complex structure. And as you can see, if there would be any changes in the arrangement of the cells, this would basically impair your, your, your vision. So that's why it's important to, 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 to see any changes, if possible, in vivo to the structure. And, and, and just the, you know, 
simple uh, rearrangement of the cells w w w w would result in, 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 in loss of the vision or your ability to see, see clearly. Relative to those two bottom pictures, uh -huh. the pupil of the eye is actually down. Exactly. So actually here, so the, the really funny, 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 funny thing is that division science and ophthalmology tend to use different way, ways of describing retina. In ophthalmology, you would also you would only see the light going from the top or from the left in this image. In the vision science, people tend to, and neuroscience tend to present right now kind of upside down the light going from the, from, from the bottom. But, but, I mean, but I have to pass through all those cell layers before. That's true. However, if you look at the fovea, they're really, it, it, there's really not, not much of the layers there. So it, it, it's true that, but, but the actual reason for that is that uh, th those cells are really, they actually use a huge amount of energy. And, and the way the nature of design the system is that actually here at, 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 the, at the end of those interceptors, you have, you have the back of the eye with, with really uh, high vasculature. It's so actually the, 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 the nutrition is going, is entering the cells from this side. So that's why there's, uh, I think that that's the way the nature allows the cells to, to reuse all of energy. So you have actually, not shown here, some art, for example, you have epithelial cells, and then through underneath them there would be some. some uh, so this is actually really changing depending on, on the location where you are. So if you if you actually in the, yeah if you show here if you actually in the fovea it's roughly one to one correspondence, but then if you if you're far away from the fovea it can be one to hundred. So that's why you really you're really losing your your spatial resolution really, really fast. And uh, so here's actually an example of what what kind of cells do we have in the retina. So so I was showing you the, 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 this graph, but here's actually the, uh, the histology cross-section. So, so someone actually took an, an, uh, an eye after someone died, then sliced it and put it under the microscope. So this, this is basically the cross-section of the retinal layers under the microscope. And you can see all those different, uh, all different cell types. And again, here, here, in this case, actually, light is going from the top. So you would see, uh, again, here you have this, this, this base, base layer with a lot of uh, capillaries and a lot of the blood supply. On top of that, we have other receptors. And then you, you start getting uh, all, all, this, all different cell types. Eventually, all this goes to your, to your, uh, to your brain. How, how thick is the retina? So, so this is about 300 micrometers. 300 to 100 micrometers. <laughs> and so and basically, it's all light with visible light. All, all with blood, just like that's true. There's no absorption of So actually, there's a lot of absorption under uh, the absorption really starts here after okay. after the, the, the so it, it's it's very trans it's very uh, yeah it doesn't reflect too much light but it still reflects some light but the main main absorption is on the, in this RP there's no big pigment epithelial cells and also those and the blood below are really responsible for, for the reddish color of our eyes and, uh, and here actually a, a kind of pyramid of how many different type of cells you have in your in your retina. So there's about six million cones, which are the ones that are the cells responsible for our night, for our day vision, and that those are really mainly concentrated in the, in the center of the fovea. And then the density really goes down outside the fovea. There's a lot of rods, and but they're they're, they're, they're fairly small. And then there's uh, this human uh, epithelium cells, ganglion cells, bipolar cells, robot cells. And again, these different cells are basically are taking part in the image processing. And the interesting thing is that, that right now we're actually able to image probably about 96% of the retinal cells in vivo. But because people are, are really skilled with making this operation, we're able to see all the cells in vitro. So we really know how retina is, 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 is built. What, what, what is the reason that there's uh, like 20 times more rows than cones? Is oh, it because so, so, one so, for night vision and less mm -hmm. so, so, well, I, you know, I can just. Uh, I'm not sure. For, I don't know for sure, but the idea is that those are really small, small cells. So, if, if rods are about, uh, you know, two two micrometers in diameter, the cones are roughly five, five, six micrometers in diameter, and they're and and I, and I guess they're also much less, much more sensitive. So they're so so if, if, actually, if you go outside the fovea, most of most of the retina is really covered by the rods, and then there are some some sparse cones because the cones really gives you the, the colors. And they're not the colors. Right? gives colors, and they're really sharp vision in the center. And the rods gives gives us a, a kind of different cues, and they're really responsible for the night vision. So, but they, they, they're smaller, and they just I think that's the way the nature kind of builds us. We can we can work in a both world, night and day.
And so interesting thing right, actually right now is that we can actually see qu quite a lot of the, of the photoreceptors of the counts. I will, I will show you some images later. We cannot really detect worlds that are too small. And, th and this is due by the we are limited by the resolution of, of, the, of the eye, and I will also talk about it later. And we can also see some of the of different cells, but those are mainly visible through uh, not through simple imaging with the backscattering, but we actually use we are actually using some kind of alpha fluorescence imaging so to, to see those cells. Actually, this pigment cells has a lot of uh, alpha fluorescence compared to, to all those other cells. Okay. So now I'll also give you some basics about actually the front of the eye so we have some better feeling how, how we do the imaging. So again, this is the eye. You know that the retina already, and this is the, that's the nerve head, that's the part when the, when the nerve fibrillary goes to the brain, also where the, all the vasculature is entering the retina to, 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 to feed the cells with, with, the, with the nutritions. You got the, here's the lens, uh, the pupil, and the iris. And then you have a cornea. So the idea is that the, the, the lens uh, allows us to, to accommodate because we can change the shape of the lens. The, even though it, it would look like the, the lens should be the strongest optical element in the, in the eye, actually it's not. The, the strongest optical element is the cornea. So if you actually, here you have an, uh, an information about uh, what was the optical power of the of different optical, different system, of different uh, surfaces in the, red, in, in the eye. So one diopter basically would focus the light about one meter away from, from the lens. If you have uh, 49 diopters, it's, it's basically 40 times, 49 times stronger uh, imaging, imaging element. So actually the, the, the front surface of the cornea is the strongest optical element in the eye. And that's why any imperfection in shape of the, of the, of the cornea would really affect your vision a lot. And that's also why the, the contact lenses and the and laser surgery are so, so successful, because by changing just the front surface of the, of the, of the eye, you can really change a lot of a lot of uh, optical power, and then and also the reason for that is that the, the, the optical power of the of the lens depends on the refractive index difference between two two media, and because in front of your eye you have a you have an air, and which has a refractive index of one, and the cornea has a refractive index of about one point three, it's a really huge step. But if you compare those two then steps between the cornea, and the the humors which humors which are basically the the liquids between the, the elements and then the lines that they're not such big differences. You probably also realize when you when you when you're swimming and when you when you open your eyes you don't really see clearly and that's because you basically don't have any more this really high power of your of your of your of your uh, refractive refractive power of your of your of your cornea. So the total total power of the eye is about 60, 60 uh, diopters, which is basically enough to focus the light down to about uh, uh, twenty uh, millimeters uh, optical focal length. The, 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 the geometrical focal length of the eye is 24 millimeters, and so here you have some other parameters. Is that the same fluid for the retina? Yes, yeah, so actually, so, so all this is, is, is filled with uh, water like fluid. Oh, okay. And also, there's it's actually gel like structure, it's called, it's called the vitreous humor. And there's also some fluid between the lens and, and, the, and the cornea. And actually, the, those are also important to keep. Uh, so actually, I has a slightly higher pressure to keep its shape as, 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 as a sphere. Okay, so here, just to remind you, so basically the, the anatropic eye is the eye that has a, uh, optical power uh, match, matching the focal, uh, the length of the eye, so we have your image in, 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 in a, on the retina. This basically means you have a sharp vision, there's no correction required, and then you have really, really good vision. And uh, so that's the anatropic eye. Uh, if you have myopic eye, the optical power uh, of your eyes is too, too strong. So basically, your eye, your eye is too powerful, and then you, 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 your images are focused, focused outside the in front of the retina. So you basically need something to, to reduce the power of your eye. But of course, if you have something really close to your eye, you, you are able to focus that in the retina. That's why it's called nearsightedness, because you can see objects really close to your eye. And then on the opposite side, it's, it's, it's hyper. Hyperopia or hi hypermetropia. So basically, your optical power of your eye is too weak, so you need to have, you need to add an extra optical element to actually bring the, the light into focus. And uh, so I, I bring this to you right now because if you think about the imaging, basically works the same way. If you want to image retina, you need to compensate for all the aberrations your eye had. 
So, so, so basically, we need to put the same correction to, to see sharp retina as the person would need to, to see sharply the world outside. And uh, that's another interesting thing to, to, to keep in mind is that the first way of the first way of the is um, is reduction in the focusing power of the eye with age. So what is basically happening is that your lens with age becomes really stiff and it cannot really it doesn't really change its shape. That doesn't allow it to change its shape, and it's really changing drastically. So basically, this is the the age of the person, and this is uh, how close to your how close to your eye you can focus. So when you're really young, you can focus really close up to five centimeters, ten centimeters. But when you're getting older, you're basically not able to focus uh, to focus uh, at, the, at the close distance to your eye. And then you start to need to have glasses for for reading or for, for driving. So that's uh, this is basically presbyopia. So everyone around age 50, 45 needs to have a set of glasses for reading. If you have actually for reading, if you have if you if you, if you have a myopic eye, but if you have another Condition, you may just need the glasses for for, for, for writing, and eventually your, your lines become so uh, so dense that you, you cannot accommodate at all. Uh, I also want to point out that there is a lot of aberrations, not not just simple defaults. We just I just talked about there's astigmatism. Basically, the line that the, cor- the cornea is not shaped as a sphere, and you basically end up having uh, elongated focus. So basically, the, 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 there's no good position to, there's really no, no one nice focus in your, in, in your eye. So if someone has a stigma, you need to correct it, otherwise the, the image will be, will, will be blurred all the time. And uh, of course, this can be uh, combined, connected with other aberrations as well. And, and there are also even higher aberrations. So you can think about it this way. If this is the way you see the word with the perfect correction of your eye, if you add aberrations, you basically start blurring your blur, blurring the world you see. But if you think about the imaging systems, what is happening is also that you are you are blurring your point spread function. So basically, your ability to, to sample the, the the image on the on the right now. So here, basically, you would see that the, the resolution of your system would be also connected with the with the aberration of the of, of the subject you're imaging. But this is caused uh, by, by the lens. Yeah, so actually, this is caused by, by all the all the optical elements, but probably the, the cornea will be the, the, the strongest factor there. So any imperfection. Actually, everyone has aberrations in, in their eyes, and but th- but there are, there are some aberrations that uh, are easy to correct, like defocus and astigmatism. But there are higher higher order aberrations. So you can correct that. You cannot correct that. But the, the, the thing is that if you if, if you in a, in everyday life if you have a lot of light, your pupil are really small. And then aberrations are, are not uh, are not really affecting their life because th- those are actually important for large people. About this is really large people. But if you if you if you're driving at night, then it starts bothering you. And this is actually kind of aberration you would get when you when you perform the laser ser- surgery on, on your cornea. There are some hyper aberrations that are not corrected, and that's why people are reporting on, on, on some some problems with their night vision because then pupil becomes bigger and starts uh, starts seeing this effect. But the, but the point I want to make here is that it would be very really important when you start imaging retina at the high and high resolution, because the resolution of your system, the resolution of your system really depends on the numerical aperture you're using, and in, in, in imaging the eye, it really means you want to image to as big pupil as possible, because that's the only way you can increase the numerical aperture of your system. And if you really want to image to the large pupil, you then really start having problems with the with the aberration, so it starts. So you need to think how to how to correct them if you really want to go in this direction. So another interesting characteristic for, for imaging imaging eye is that, of course, we cannot use uh, in, in vitro systems. You, you you could put your sample under under microscope, and you really have a freedom to choose any wavelengths and, and any any kind of imaging uh, system you, you you would love to. But actually, in, in here, you actually you are limited by not only the optics but also the, the materials in front of the eye. So when you actually look at the uh, which wavelengths are, are transmitted to the eye, which means which wavelengths are, are hitting the retina. Of course, we, we, we sure that the visible, visible wavelength should, should go to the retina. But what about uh, different, uh, different wavelengths? So people actually measure this, this effect. And, uh, so he, here's roughly the, ocular, the two figures that are really important. So first is the ocular media scattering. So if you look at the, at the curve, it basically tells you how, uh, how much light is scattered for different wavelengths. You can see that about 400, 400 nanometers 
all the optical elements in front of the retina are, are starting scattering the light. So basically, the light is not really transmitting. You don't really, you're not able to get <coughs> wavelengths shorter than 400 nanometers to your eye. That's on the short, short end side. And then on the long, the long end side, you actually have uh, water absorption because the eye, eye is actually the, the main eye component is, is, is the water. So here is actually, so here are the, the water absorption curve. So if you look at that, uh, so the melanin is actually in, uh, are, is in, on the retina already. But if this is the water absorption, you can see that there is uh, quite quite a nice low, low absorption band over here, and maybe here. So what's what we're really getting at the end is that the, the usable spectrum that can be used for for accessing the retina between 400 and 950 nanometers, and then there's another small window between 1,000 1, nanometers and 1,100 nanometers. So those are two uh, optical windows we can access right now through in vivo. And then uh, I was telling you about, uh, of course we know that we can access through different wavelengths, but how about these aberrations? So, so apparently the, the optical power of the eye, which is default, depends on the, on the wavelengths. And this is because the water refractive index also depends on the wavelengths. So if, you, if, you, if you're looking at the relative defocus of different wavelengths, you will see that there's quite a big, big of, uh, defocus between different wavelengths. So you can actually, if you really want to use the broadband spectrum, like, like in spectrometers, really think about it, how are you going to compensate for this effect? Because this is actually quite a big effect. And by the way, actually, half a diopter is enough to, to shift your image completely out of the retina. Half a, diop half a diopter shifts the image should they focus more, more than the thickness of the right now. And uh, there, also, there are also some studies about the higher order aberrations. Apparently, people find out that there's not a big variation in the higher order aberrations uh, as a function of wavelength. So the main, so you, you really, the main aberration you have to worry about is uh, the defocus in this case. And if you have defocus, we also have uh, transverse magnetic aberrations. So we also need to keep in mind that if you want to image right now with the broadband light sources, you need to compensate for this transverse monitoring aberrations and also for, for active monitoring aberrations. Okay, that's not important right now. Another, another interesting thing about the eye is actually the laser safety. So if, you, if you're imaging right now, and if you do it on the, in, vivo, in vivo in the patient, you don't want to damage right now, which is really, really critical. To, 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 to people's uh, everyday life. So th there's actually this American National Institute of Standard who issued this laser safety standard for eye. And, and basically, what we have here we have uh, limiting uh, uh, powers that can be sent to the eye in, in watts as a function of the size of the of the spot you're producing on the retina. So in this case, this would be uh, the smallest spot you could create. This, this is uh, one degree, it's about slightly bigger one, that's actually large, large field of view. As you can see, the, the smaller spot you're creating, the, the less power you can, you can send to the eye because your, your power density at the retina increases a lot. And also that in a visible range, you, you even, you're not even able to get uh, even further reducing the, 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 the powers you can send to the eye. And there are actually three mechanisms that are responsible for, for damaging retina with, with the light. So the chemical damage, basically, if you send enough light to the eye in a visible spectrum, you would basically, uh, uh, the, the, the total pigments in, uh, in, in photoreceptors would, bas would basically uh, start being, after absorbing so much light, they would, they would, become, they would become toxic. And they would basically uh, make photoreceptors die. That, that's really bad. And thermal is basically heating retina. If you send too much light at mm -hmm. even longer wavelengths, you can actually uh, Heat retina to the point that it's, it's also going to be damaged. So we, I think the thermal damage is set for about if you, if you increase the temperature by about 10 degrees Celsius, you you, you start uh, damaging your retina. So so, by, and so I guess the, the take home message is that the, the the safe light levels for the retina are about are lower than one milliwatt roughly. In uh, and actually the visible are, are even below 100 mi 100 uh, microwatts or so. So if you have a laser pointer that has about one milliwatt, it's not really safe to sense your to, to your eye. So the photochemical essentially is going through it out. 
I think so, yeah. Maybe. I think actually, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the details, but it actually creates, it's not just a strong I think it actually creates some, some uh, byproducts which is toxic to the receptors. And, and, and actually, the danger with this is that they, they are, this is actually uh, a cumulative effect. So, so basically, if you have a thermal damage, you just, send, you just send some light, and then if you go back after five minutes, you can send the same amount of light. But with the, the photochemical one, you need to really calculate how much you, you have trailed some, let's say, some, some time, because otherwise you, you start getting... And actually, if you look at this, if you compare, let's say, 600 to 400 nanometers. So this is, uh, look at that, so a bit scale. So the light levels you can use is, you know, four orders of magnitude lower. It's a huge, actually, it's, it's, a, very, it's, a, very, it's a very big effect. Those actually are second, so... Yeah. So here's also the way how you would calculate that, but it's kind of too much details for you right now. It's not about the EVG. So again, we know where there's this eye, this is the retina, and here's again the, the, the histological cross-section of the retina. And, and here actually are examples of the different instruments that can be used for, for retinal imaging, and those graphs represent the point spread functions, which basically tells you what's the, the, the sampling uh, representation of your system. So, so here is the standard uh, Yes, yeah, so basically you would see that the, this, this basically tells you how, how small the details you would see with, 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 your, with each of the imaging systems. So let's now go to the actual example. So the, so the beginning of the retinal examinations are not really long. And so probably, you know, about 150 years ago, uh, people just realized that if you, if, you just shine the, if, you, if you shine the light to someone's eye, if you actually go really close to this person, you can actually start seeing the retina. And this is so-called direct ophthalmoscopy exam examination. So it's just enough to, to, to send the, the, the light by some person to someone's eye, and you can actually see the back of this person's eye. Which is, so basically what you see, what you see actually you have a two very simple type of cameras. The one camera is the person who's seeing it. So serving another one is the one who actually is the eye. You can serve. And then the next step was just you know, a couple of years after that, uh, people realized you can actually build some kind of more complex optical element by just holding some some, some lenses, you can then they, they build so called uh, uh, indirect thermoscope, and, and you don't have to be really close to the patient's eye. And, and the thing is that actually those are still used even nowadays. If, if people, if you go to the eye doctor, they very often just, just shine the light to your, to your eye, and this is really still, still in use. And, uh, but here, here's the kind of schematic of the, of the modern Fundus camera. Fundus camera is basically the, the system that is used to, to image the back of your eye, which is Fundus. So what you need to, to have first is you need to, to this is an eye again. This is the, the retina here. Here's the, the front of the eye. So first you need to send the light to the eye because there's no there's no light in the eye. So you have to shine the light on the retina, and then the light is back back scattered and enters your camera. So you just need to put everything in focus. It doesn't really look. Let me turn off the lights here. So it's better. So here actually a photo taken by the police camera. As you can see here, he, here's the part where it's optical nerve head. And here's the center phobia. It's, it's slightly darker because we have more pigments in, in the center. But that's, uh, that's the very basic of the police cameras. And those were, are, were around for some time. But the really big revolution came with the modern CTs when you can actually record this, this image and you can store them. So this is the standard uh, examination you would get in hand. It's actually a uh, polarized light you're shining in or is it? And, and so you, you can use polarized light. That I will talk about it later. But in a very basic, in a very basic instrument, you would just shine uh, just, just light to kind of get to, 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 to have something to get back to your camera. And you can you can then play with the different wavelengths and polarization, and can, you can basically try to find out different. Uh, you can see different effects. But the very the very simple one is just send the light and, and, and measure it back. So again, this is up in there, and this is the following. And this is how the public instruments looks nowadays. So you have some kind of camera on top. The operator would see would sit here and, and, and position the whole system on your eye and then take the photo and he would see the, the photo like that on, on the screen. And usually here would be the subject with some kind of chin rest and the forehead rest to, to keep the, the, the head steady. And and actually the fullest camera is nothing more than the low power microscope. Uh, yeah, it basically allows you to, to take the, the, the photo at the back of your, of your eye. And, uh, and, of, and of course, there are, there are now modern films cameras, which, which really uh, gives you more. So there's one, one example of the stereo films camera. 
which actually takes the two, two images at the same time of your, of your, of your retina at a slightly different angle. And then you can use special glasses to view that, and it actually really gives you a nice, nice view of the, of, the volumetric, uh, of the volume of the retina. I'll talk later about uh, spectroscopic ways of, of enhancing contrast in, in the retina, but you can basically use some, uh, some uh, fluorescein or ICG agent you can put it into a patient's blood, and then you, you actually uh, look at the, at the fluorescence uh, images. Or you can actually have a really fast from this camera that can actually detect uh, flows, uh, can also measure really, really small changes in their effectivity. So basically, full cameras is, are instruments that are basically taking pictures of the back of your eye. And if you have a really, really fast camera, you can actually do it really, in a really fast way that can really allow you to detect uh, changes on, on a very fast temporal scale. So that's, that's the answer. From this camera, that's the uh, angiography. And this is what I mentioned. In this case, you can actually measure the flow of each of the small capillaries on the back of your eye around, around the phobia. So another, another instrument used uh, clinically nowadays in, in, a, in, a, in a retinal imaging is so-called scanning laser thermoscope. Scanning laser thermoscope is, is actually a confocal laser scanning microscope that is basically applied for the eye. So, so what, what we're doing here basically is sending a, a point of light to, 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 to the object, and then the light is back reflected, and then you're using other confocal vehicle to reject all the light that gets back scattered outside the the focal plane of your system. So this is, so this, this in, in comparison to the Fumus camera, is better in a way that it allows you to, to just get, get images at slightly better uh, actual sectioning, and you can also get slightly better, better lateral resolution. And additionally, you, if you have a subject that has uh, scattered media, like the lens or, or other parts of, 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 their, of their eyes, you can actually increase your signal from, from, from the retina. So in, in, in those systems, however, instead of getting one image at a time, you actually need to scan your beam in the raster of the retina to get to feel that image. So again, the comfortable is scanning microscopy, that's, that's how it works. And, uh, and basically this is how people are, are calling, uh, people in ophthalmology are calling those scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. Is that what we're calling with fluorescence? Or so actually, you, 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 can do it, you can do it with the fluorescence, and you can do it with the, with the, fullest, cam with the fullest cameras. But I think mo most cases people are still using full cameras for for, uh, for angiography. But I think for uh, for auto fluorescence people are also using the uh, the, the SLLs nowadays. But it, it, it actually there's still I think they're they're still not in, on the market. They they just started to, to emerging on the market. They're the first studies. So it's still growing and market. So with, with, the, with the SLL we can get we can actually get some information about the depth structure. So in this case, this is the topography of the retina. Uh, there are commercial instruments that basically are, are able to, uh, to do <laughs> very basic tests about based on the topography. So one of the leading causes of blindness in developed countries is, is glaucoma, which basically is a disease when your uh, ganglion cells and nephropy layers are dying, so the, the signals are not transferred to your brain. And apparently this is easy to observe in the change of the, of the optical nerve head. If your optical nerve head is, it becomes bigger, then you can you, you, you see that this person has a bigger chance of, of developing glaucoma. So that's why one of the diagnostic tools here would be to look at the change in the thickness of, of the nerve layer or, or the size of the, of the optical disc. That's what this instrument is doing. There are also instruments, like we mentioned, that are actually measuring the polarization of, of the light getting back from the retina. And this is also a commercial instrument from not not from size. It's using this kind of scanning laser of thermoscopy and just looking at the, how much the, the polarization state was, was rotated. Uh, how much will the retina change polarization? So, so the interesting thing is that the, the, nerve, the, the, the nerve fibers, the, the top layer of the retina, which is responsible for sending the electrical signal to the brain, it, it does have basically bundles of fibers that are very well arranged. And the idea there is that the, the, those, are, those are really highly biofringent because the light polarized towards the uh, direction of the bundles has a slight different speed of the light that causes a different polarization state. And so here you actually have an effect of... So, so what they actually claim is that what they measure really is just the thickness of this nerve fiber layer. And this is again interesting uh, diagnostic tool for, for glaucoma where, where this would be, when this structure would be affected. So, so, so of course, they're, they're, so each so each of the retinal layers has slightly different properties. 
and actually Nakai Ole would be the one that has that, that should have some bifringes bifringes effect. One of the problems though is that the cornea has, is also bifringent, so there's they actually spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to remove the, the artifacts created by the by the cornea when imaging uh, retina. And another interesting development is that there is, there's a company trying to, to, to give the really uh, large field of view clinical systems. So that's what the images I was showing you before are basically were covering just this part of the, of the retina. And now there's, there's a company that uh, uh, opted that basically creates this, you almost see 180 degree, not really, but maybe 160 degree. So you really have an image of the whole eye. And those may be useful for, for doctors because they usually don't really, you know, they don't really spend all the time to look around here outside, but this may be important for, for early detection of some disease. And also this company obviously is, is, is involved with in, uh, in developing and bringing to the market uh, the systems with adaptive optics I will talk about later, which are for, for really high resolution imaging. Have you heard of a handheld, like a panoptic optic? Yeah, they, they, they have those. So it's actually the, uh, the, the handheld systems are really useful for, for in, in pediatric ophthalmology. We have a small kids. Or if we have the babies that are just so sidated, so that's so actually we we we, we yeah they're, they're, we can buy uh, I'm not sure about AR SLO, about SLO, but I'm, I'm sure we can buy it from these cameras. <coughs> and we actually have some uh, we are also involved in developing OCT with, with the handheld probes. So now another very actually emerging and very popular uh, technique is optical reference tomography. So in this technique, uh, you're actually able to to get really high resolution axial information in, in contrast to all the previous techniques. So, so the way it works is it uses an uh, interferometer, interferometer uh, to reconstruct the depth scattering profile. And so it's not very really important how it, all the details, but basically you, you're interfering light from the reference arm from the sample arm, and this allows you to, to basically see the depth scattering profile of, of your sample. And so here, here's how it works. So this, this, this also uses the, the idea of, of the confocal system, like in SLO. So you would send the light to your, to your uh, just the one into your eye, and then from each of these elements, the light will get back reflected. And uh, because you're using this technique, you're actually able, exactly, you'll be able to tell exactly from which uh, part of the sample the, the light was back reflected. So if you know, so this really works like ultrasound in a way that you, you it was also you know. Uh, from which depth different uh, uh, acoustic waves were, were reflected. So that, that, that's kind of similar to the, the ultrasonic with, with optics. I uh, so the, uh, the reflectance is probably related to the index of reflection. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so the How accurate can you distinguish between the index? No, so that's actually what you're doing is that uh, the, the, light, the light is that reflected and actually it's also backscatter because if, if you think about it, you, you really have a lot of you really have a lot of uh, solar structures that are really scattering light, mm -hmm. and and so basically the, the the amount of the scattering just tells you how bright, how much light do you have from this layer, but the depth is actually reconstructed using different properties. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but uh, so so, so the. The idea here is that the position of the mirror allows you to tell exactly where the light was, was backscattered from. So if you, if you now move the mirror, you can actually reconstruct exactly that each of Even though all this light is going back and forth all the time, you can actually, it's, it's so-called continuous gating, you can actually gate exactly which photons are coming from which depth. And then just the, the amplitude of the signal will tell you how much of, of the scattering of this depth you, 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 you are getting. So basically here, again, if you, you would have some kind of scattering profile like this, that does the scattering profile. So you only get back photons when you have something that scatters like If there's no, no scattering, you have no signal. Mm -hmm. And then basically when you plot it as intensity, and then you add together all these lines that will give you an image, that's how it looks like. Okay. Okay. I, what type of uh, laser light do you use? Do you use a continuous? So, 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 it, it, so in this technique, what you're actually using using uh, broadband light source and uh, the, the, way, the way this, this works is that the broadband light source is really short coherence lengths. If you have a laser, the laser if you have a single wavelength can, can produce that the, the coherence ranges even if, you, if the path length is different between two 
to be there is really long. With the broadband light sources, you have to match the path length between two arms, even up to two micrometers or less. So basically, in this system, you would see that the current fringes only if the path length difference between those two arms is within the coherence length of your light source. Mm -hmm. So that, that's actually the way how, how, this is, how this works. So you have the light source with the really short coherence length. So then, as you move the, the mirror, you're only, seeing, you're only seeing coherence or the fringes at the matching positions. Mm -hmm. And then, so maybe... Are you scanning the mirror? So, so the, the one way to do it is, is to actually scan the mirror. So when you scan the mirror, so basically this will be the position of your mirror, reference mirror, and as you scan, on your detector, you, you basically observe change in intensity yeah. from from the from, from, from the signal. So basically, each 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 move. So you're moving the mirror once, and you're getting this scattering profile from the from the sample. And uh, yeah, that's actually the, the different ways of acquiring signal. That's so-called time domain. There's also another way of getting the signal, but I, I don't want to uh, get too much into that now. But basically. Then, if you have this one line, you, you're able to get the, the depth scattering profile. And then, by simply uh, moving the, the, the scanning beam, you're able to get an image like that. And here again, when you actually scan the retina, you get an image like this. So, this is an LCD image of the retina where you basically see you now all these layers I was talking about reconstructed. Now, that's actually indeed, those both are indeed images. So here, here are uh, examples of the commercial systems that are using this, this OCT technique. So you can see there's like, like, like six in the market. And uh, the really powerful thing about OCT is that it's, it allows you in, in a fairly uh, fast way to acquire large amounts of data that can be actually then used to create the volumes of the retina. So here's, so basically what those systems are doing, they're scanning retina in a raster-like way. And then for each position of the raster, they're getting gap information. So this is why they're able now to reconstruct. This is the, again, individual image of the, of the fovea acquired with the OCT. So you can see now uh, the shape. You can also start seeing all the layers. And basically, each of this layer now corresponds to different type of the cells. So the system doesn't have a good resolution to resolve the cells in the lateral, in the lateral direction, but they have a good enough actual resolution to really allow you to see the, the, the cell structure. And actually, if you look here, I don't have an example of the healthy retina, but actually now you can see that you're able to, to see any kind of changes in shape in different layers that would allow you to, to diagnose the patients better. Uh, how fast can you scan that, actually? So, so there, there are, uh, so this is actually an example of in vivo image acquired. So this would be uh, about eight second acquisition. So this was basically uh, how fast the system works. But, but there are actually systems nowadays that can scan even 10 times faster or 100 times faster. So th this is, this is, uh, yeah, so we can actually get, right now you can get a uh, couple, maybe five, four images per second if, if you have really state of the art system. So this, this, this now becomes very, um, very powerful technique. So here's actually an example, kind of off view. So we, so again, you, you scan this the, through the middle of the retina, and this is the fovea. You can actually now compare that uh, on the histological section, those layers really correspond to the, to the layers of the OCT. However, there is still some discrepancy, and you can actually try to, to tell exactly which layer, and which, which, which structure corresponds to, to what, what, what kind of layer. Uh, and the resolution, what is the pattern that then depends on the, Sorry? the, the resolution? So, so, the, so, the the length? so, exactly. So the actual resolution depends on the coherence length. And so the broadband, the light source, the, 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 the higher actual resolution. So, so usually people people are using about 800 nanometer center light source. So if, if you want to have about 2 micrometers resolution, you need to have 150 nanometer bandwidth mm -hmm. of your light source. And how deep can you go? Like, so, so, so this, this uh, it depends on the tissue. In retina you can go uh, up to the, uh, the choroid here, and then the light is not, it's really heavily absorbed and, and scattered. You not, don't really measure that. But it, it also changes with the wavelengths. But, but for skin imaging, you can go up to 2 millimeters or, or 1 millimeter, again, depending on the wavelengths. OCT. And also with, with this OCT technique, you can actually try to segment different layers and try to get more uh, quantified information about the thickness of different layers. This, this again, may help you to, to better diagnose the, any changes in the retina. So another 
I mean, I only got I don't guess where that is. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, can you also kind of like use something like Raman, for example? Like if you would have like a kind of like great Raman scattering there, uh-huh. and then and then yeah, try try to make like OCT Raman. Uh-huh. Is that possible? So so actually pe- people are people are trying to to do it, and uh, so 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 the problem with that. Because the problem with the Raman is that if you go back to the so the, w- the way OCT works is just it, it, it relies on the on the coherence between the light from the sample and the reference. Mm-hmm. So if you'd like to if you'd like to create Raman, you need to have a sample with the same material that will actually create for you the Raman reference yeah. signal, yeah. Yeah. and that that's tricky. And also the Raman signal is not broadband, <coughs> so you would, you would not have your actual resolution then properly. So there's I, I, I think there, there's, yeah, there, there, there's, uh, I, I, I think that people are trying to do, to do that, but I, I, I don't, I don't think they're really doing it for, for, for eye. They, they're trying to, to use it for microscopy imaging. And, uh, but I'm, but I, I, I'm not sure they're actually getting much, much better resolution or, or I think it's possible to do, but I don't think they're actually getting, uh, anything more than you would get with it from the standard systems. So, so, so one of the limitations of all the systems right now is that the eye itself doesn't have a good, app, good quality of the optics. So you cannot, so you cannot really use the, uh, all the purpose of your systems because the eye itself, if you have a microscope, then you, you basically spend as much money as you, as you want and as you have for, for the objective to have really good quality of the image. And in, 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 the, in ophthalmic applications, the, the objective is actually the, the patient's eye. So you cannot really change it. The only way to kind of improve it is to, to use circle that, that optics to remove all the aberrations you would have in someone's eye to really get to the best possible resolution. So, so basically, all, all the instruments I, I described so far can be combined with adaptive optics to, to have even higher resolution that you can really start getting information about the single cells. Because all the previous ones are really kind of global, uh, global information. So here again you get see that depending on the, on the patient's aberration, you, you would get uh, better or worse, uh, or worse imaging properties. Uh, and the way that a lot of optics works basically is that you have, you have a subject that has a, some aberration in, in the eye. What you want to do, you want to basically have a mirror that would correct uh, all the aberrations and then basically it would allow you to have a sharp image. This actually will work both ways. So you can... Uh, you can, you can use it for, for to correct the patient's the, the subject vision, or you can use it for imaging really sharp, sharp in the right hand. So that's the idea. And then what you have to do, you have to measure this way from, and then by computer will analyze and, and tell you how to shape this mirror to compensate for aberrations. And, and AO has a lot of applications. One of the applications would be for, for star imaging when you're also co- when you're correcting for the, for the atmospheric aberrations. There's also... AO is also now applied to, to improve the performance of the microscope when you also correct them for the aberration of the, of, the, of the objectives. But in this case, you would correct for the person's aberrations in the eye. And uh, so, so that's the example of the system. Basically, they, again, they have to, have to send the light of the eye, they have a DVM to correct, and then you can take the images from the back of the eye. So the only difference between the previous system with the, with the very basic uh, uh, from this camera now is that you have to have an extra light create uh, an artificial beacon that would send that would allow you to measure the aberration of the eye. And this is usually done by so-called wave, carbon shock wavefront sensor. So this, this, small, uh, this small element allows you to measure the shape of the, of the wavefront that goes from the eye. And then it allows you to, to change the shape of the mirror so actually you're, getting, you, you're canceling those aberrations and you can get a really sharp image after you, you turn on your illumination and then you're getting the light back from, from the eye to your that's really small. Uh, how does it actually measure the wavefront? So, so the way the way the way uh, you measure the wavefront is that you have uh, you have uh, an array of a small lens lenses. It's called lenslet array, and so usually you have let's say twenty by twenty small lenslets, and you have a CD camera uh, uh, beyond those those lenslets. So if you have a flat wavefront. Uh, all the lenslet's focuses would be at the center, basically right behind the lenslet. If you start changing shape of this, of this wavefront, then the focal points 
our, our focus spots would start moving in different directions. And basically, we then have to calculate how much each spot has, has moved from the center position. And these are, this are actually slopes of the waveform. So you would then have to uh, calculate how those slopes are, 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 are represented in the waveform. And then you can, this waveform can be then, and then you can try to shape this mirror to the waveform. But that's for how it works. And this is, a, this is actually standard, standard technique for, also for, uh, for measuring the, the optical quality of the eye. And uh, so in this case, this is used to, to correct aberrations, but it's also now, now this used for, for to get really high information, to, really, to get information about higher the aberrations of, of your eye. And, uh, and actually, modern LASIK uh, systems are actually using those type of weapon sensors to, to find out well, what kind of aberration do you have, and they try to correct even higher aberrations with, with the shape of your cornea. So actually, so here you're actually getting this is um, a kind of a fast view of the other sectors. You can see that. All those single dots are actually computer sectors. And I will have some more images later. This is an example of such an instrument. This is how it looks like in optical optical lab. So you basically have uh, an eye here. You have all those optical elements. Here's an eye. You have two different, you have one light for wave sensing, one for, for, for imaging. And then at the end, the light ends up in the in your, in your science camera that's able to get the images of the eye. So again, this is the fullness, fullness, fullness plot of the eye. This is what kind of, of details you can see with the, with the adaptive optics from this camera. So you're not, you're not able to see the full field of view. You just have a really small field of view. But actually now you start seeing those, those, those spots. And actually those are comfort receptors. That's the way people are able to see the single uh, comfort receptors in, in, in the living human eye. So they, they combine adaptive optics with the full camera and then they can really, and then they can count those other receptors and they can try to, to study how, uh, how uh, density of other sectors is, is changing with the age, with, with different disease. So that, 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 that would be one of the applications of the AO, improving uh, transversal resolution. Here's actually another image. You can actually build really nice, large field of views. And here's a zoom in to one of those you know, smaller parts that actually can see all this uh, other sectors, which are actually packed in the hexagonal uh, mosaic. And those are, again, those are only counts. You cannot really see the rows. They're too small, and they're basically filling all the spaces around the, the comfort receptors. Another system that combines AO with, is, 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 with, uh, is AO with SLO. So, so here you have this comfortable microscope-like system that rasters the retina. And again, with this system, you get much better dot resolution and also slightly better axial resolution. So you can start really slicing retina here. So what 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 it does you basically is that uh, here's an example of how the system works with no AO with AO and then multiple frames. But then uh, so this basically affects how the AO is, is improving your your visibility of, of the other receptors. And here's another actually video showing uh, not now what, what the scientists were doing. They're basically changing the depth of focus of their camera. And they were imaging a really small part of this, of this retina, as you can see. So what, what we're seeing on this video here, we're basically seeing uh, the focus going from the bottom here to different retina layers. So I'll play it again. So first you're seeing the focus going from the photoreceptor layer. So you see all the photoreceptors. Then you're going to different layers. You don't really see much structure. And then eventually you end up in the nerve layer. So, so this, this technique is pretty useful in imaging photoreceptors and, and nerve layers because those are the most, mostly scattering structures in the right now. And it's not sensitive enough to really uh, see other, other, other layers. But this is really powerful for, for count counting and, 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 and also using it in a clinical, clinical setting. So that's actually, that there's a company that actually tries to commercialize those right, right now. Is this uh, kind of like a new research at the moment? Or is it so so th this actually was published probably I guess maybe 10 years ago, for the first time, five, five ten years ago. And now, now they're trying to use it for, for clinical, clinical tests, yes. Actually, so all this, so combination of AO with, with, with all clinical systems started really 15 years ago with the AO slow and AO CT, I'll show later, and also AO flat systems. Uh, the LCT itself started about 20 years ago. The SLO probably 25, 30 years ago. And the flat, and AO, and the full cameras were really uh, around for a long time. Here's another image, you can actually see that there's a lot of eye motions they actually have to correct for, for eye motion by 
by processing data after it has using the gun how it works. So you can see there is a really successful way of correcting the eye motion because this is again this is a scanning system, so if the eye is moving you have to, you have to be able to correct for that. Uh, another another combination is AO with OCP. So in this case you have adaptive optics and optical reference tomography. So you combine both you, you should have the, bet, the, the good axis resolution and good lateral resolution. If you do that, you basically put your AO inside the inside the, the sample arm of OCP. Here's an instrument how it looks like. But basically what you're getting right now, you're getting this, this cross-sectional view. At, at almost at zero resolution. So in this case here, you would start seeing uh, kind of dot-like dot structures from this layer to the photoreceptor layer. So you actually would see that the single photoreceptors uh, connected segments, uh, connections between two segments. You can now compare this to the, the OCT image mm -hmm. in this kind of magnified view. So always, always AO would always give you highly magnified parts of the retina. So if, you, if you're looking for the changes in retina on the, on the cellular level, the AO is the, best, is the best way to go. And here again with the AOCT you can actually get uh, the volumes at really high resolution. And you can start observing uh, different cell structures throughout all, all these different layers. It can be also very powerful with diagnostic. Here's so again you can try to uh, use different, different areas of the retina and try to see how the appearance of the layers is changing. You can also try to build a large, uh, try to build a mosaic of different with the AOCT, and here's actually an example of the imaging of the nine different locations. And then you can superimpose that on, on your on your Fundus photo. And here you have an AOCT volume on top of the Fundus, Fundus picture, and uh, eventually you will see a slicing plane clipping the, all the top layers. So we'll, we'll slice from the top, and you'll start seeing slicing to the nerve fiber layers, then all different cell types. Now we are now we're sliding the nerve fiber layer. You see some capillary respects and all the other layers. That's I'm not sure why it's getting so slow on this screen, but so this also is a, it's a powerful way of, uh, of creating high resolution kind of maps of retina. It can be also used later for, for studies. There are some ways to improve that. So it's almost three, say like maybe five minutes or? You guys yeah. Yeah. that? Yeah, so about retinal spectroscopy. So retinal spectroscopy is. Uh, it's, it's kind of tr tricky because you, you have an eye, so you can only measure the, back, the light that is backscattered, and also you cannot you, you don't have a freedom to use as much light as you like because you don't want to damage retina. So there, there is still a kind of limited uh, uh, so people who have limited success with using spectroscopy, and so, so one of the most successful parts is actually using the, this angiography systems, where basically you you inject. Uh, uh, fluorescein or, or, or different agent which basically increases a lot the, the, the fluorescence in, in, in your of the retina. And those are usually used ev in everyday clinical practice for, for trying to look for the, for the leakage in, in the vessels in the retina. So if someone uh, comes to the doctor and they, they suspect that they have some, some problems with their circulation of the blood and retina, they would just perform those, uh, those measurements. So how, how, this really, how this works, so basically you need to if you know what kind of agent you're sending, you basically have your excitation wavelengths, and then you have your your emission wavelengths, and then you just put in the filter to just detect the light from from from, from, from this this agent. So here's an example: the fluorescein you would excite at 488 nanometers, and you would put the filter about 580 nanometers, and you would detect all the light above this wavelengths. For the ICG, you would excite at 790 nanometers, and then you would put the filter at 810 nanometers. And so that, that, that's pretty much how the system works. So they don't really, they, they use uh, spectroscopy in a way that they, they're just using uh, some agent to enhance the contrast of some, some structures. So here's an example how this really range, and actually, it's actually images you would get with this. So here we're actually getting the fluorescein image, and here's ICG and geography. So this actually is really good to observe uh, the leakage in the, in, in the top retina layers from capillaries, and the ICG is better in observing the leakage in the, in the, in the current capillaries underneath the retina. So that, that, that's also really, really useful. Another way, uh, which is probably more, more, more appealing, is actually use some interesting signals. And people get some success in using uh, alpha fluorescence. So there, there's, uh, at the back of the retina, you have this RPE cell that actually are, has a quite a strong 
auto fluorescence signal. Here actually you can see comparison between that auto fluorescence with excitation at 488 and excitation at 787. So you can see the differences here. And basically, if any of the RV cells would be in any way damaged, you would start seeing some kind of dark dark spots in these images. And here you actually have slightly more absorption because there's some more uh, some more pigment in the center of the of the, of the phobia. Uh, th th there are some people trying to use uh, Raman spectroscopy for for retina for, for, for retina imaging and, and, and for, for, for learning about the retinal structures. But this actually is not it's really hard in a way that Raman requires a lot of light to be light, and, uh, and the signals are really are really weak. So actually the most successful application so far is actually the application of the resonant Raman spectroscopy. So in this case, the, this group from, from Werner uh, Gallerman lab claimed that uh, in, in, in condition called AMD, you should just actually have an image of the patient that has an MAD, which basically affects your, your, your retina. The, the, the claim is correlated with uh, carotenoids uh, content in your retina, and basically they, they build the system just to measure the, the amount of the carotenoids in, in, in on, on, on your retina, and that's it's one of the ways, and basically then the, 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 they tune their system just to measure one one specific molecule. And uh, so, and, and then for the eye, the, the, again, there's uh, success for, for this resonant drama, but if you, if you try to use the uh, non, uh, I think the work still has to be done on, on, on using Raman for, for, uh, for eye imaging. There, there's some Success uh, stories for okay, for applying gram on outside the eye, but again, you have always problem with the light levels in the retina. And yeah, I think I'll just probably finish now. It's very five past three, so thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Yeah.